Good morning. It is amazing to see such a great turnout here today. So I really do thank you. I would actually like to invite Patrick to come and welcome us, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, a big yura and welcome to Kwanamuka Country. Um, it's always an honour to do the smoking ceremony and doing welcome to countries on behalf of the elders in Kayak. I know a lot of you have done a lot of hard work over the years to help save, protect koalas. Dan, Kayak's also got a lot of stuff they will probably present to you later today. But yeah, make yourselves welcome on Kwanamuka Country. You'll see a couple of Indigenous people around. If there's any questions you want to ask, feel free to ask them. Yeah, so yeah, enjoy your day and thanks for having us. Hey, thank you. <laughs> there really is no one better to welcome us to country, so thank you so much for having us here on country today. We are really happy to be here. Now, I would like to start by thanking Department for Environment, Science and Innovation. They are behind and have supported this event to make it happen here on the island today. So to the team, thank you so much for making all of this happen. We are incredibly grateful and really happy to be able to talk about it exactly where we should, which is on Kondamuka country. So thank you all again for having us here today. So my name's Sharon. I don't really have to talk too much. My job is to just help keep everyone in tr on track and, and moving through our program today. So our first speaker this morning is Rihanna. She is part of the University of Sunshine Coast Detection Dog Team, and they have been speaking and working, sorry, working on koalas and other wildlife conservation for quite some time. So our team have been involved in this area since 2016. Um, and the work that this team does, I think is nothing short of absolutely amazing. Like they're out there every day and watching just how much they care for the work that they're actually doing is, it really does just warm the heart. She will be followed by other speakers. So we'll be moving through today from Paulie to Megan um, and then onwards to the kayak speakers, Dan and Darren, and finally, Jeff. So today you'll have ability to answer, to ask your questions. If technology is not your best friend, I just ask that you give the questions to me in the break and afterwards. Um, but what we actually do is put it through the technology so that then I've got them all sitting here in a nice long list and hopefully we can get through all of the questions. So we'll see just how many come from you all today as you actually listen. So welcome to those in the room and also to those that are actually online. It's a, a real pleasure to actually have you here. We will be recording this full session. We make them available as fast as we possibly can, thanks to Sean and his amazing sort of time and energy that he gives to us from Griffith University. We will also give a PDF copy of the slides. So don't feel like you have to take photos of absolutely everything. It will all be there after the session and up online early next week. So with no further ado, this is the Slido. So if you take a photo of that QR code, you can actually ask your questions any time you want. So again, if tech isn't your best friend, don't worry. Just feed it through to me or members of our team. They're sitting here with the koala t-shirts and they'll be more than happy to help you just get your question into the, the actual lineup set. So with no further ado, I'm actually going to also point out the fact that we have the wildlife rescue number. And if you, again, if you take that QR code photo, that will lock into your telephone. So if you live here on the island, really useful contact to actually have. When it's happening, you don't have to worry about who or how to ring. You're going to have it in your phone it's sitting right there. So very useful thing to actually do. So Rihanna, over to you. That way. Oh. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Rihanna Gardner. I'm actually here instead of Dr. Roman Christescu, who is our team leader. She is currently gallivanting in France, enjoying croissants and all sorts. Um, and so I got the privilege to come here today and talk to you about the innovations for koala conservation that this team is um, conducting. So we're a team that relocated to the University of the Sunshine Coast in 2015. Um, this team actually started with Roman here on the island. She did her PhD here, fell in love with Minjerba, claims it is the best place in the world. She'll preach it till no end. Um, and she was actually looking for koala scats by herself on her hands and knees and decided there must be a faster way. And so she's built this team um, and now we're, we've got a full team of detection dogs, three that are specially trained, two in training. We're about 20 humans um, in the team to some sort of capacity. We've done 4,700 surveys across Queensland and New South Wales. We 
doing drone surveys and we're up to a thousand now where we've detected 3000 koalas, which we think is amazing. And we've also collected 4,700 koala scats for um, genetic analyses, which I'll talk about later. So why do we need to innovate? I think this room knows why the koala is in trouble, um, especially in Queensland and New South Wales. Within 10 years, which is kind of the time span that Homan has been studying these, they went from vulnerable to endangered. We know that their threats are many compounded and culminating over periods of time. Um, they're also hard to spot and therefore they're very difficult to study over time and therefore they're a red flag and they're telling us, please, can you do something to make sure that their persistence into the future is somewhat guaranteed. So we have sort of harnessed three sort of innovations, we call them. They're really standards of practice that we use. And the first one is obviously our beautiful detection dogs. They've got a nose that can smell anything if well motivated. Um, these guys are all ball obsessed and they have all helped us to use um, their noses to find evidence of koalas. That first evidence that we're really like harnessing is the koala scat. Um, Koalas can poop about 100 a day, which means that's left in the environment. Oops, sorry. Um, and these guys have helped us to um, map koala distribution, determine presence and absence, and also look at um, molecular analyses, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, to use the dogs, we obviously are scientists, so we wanted to test them compared to humans. And we found that they are 150% more accurate than humans in the field. And also they are 20 times quicker. In this case, it's a no brainer. You're gonna use dogs versus humans to get the work done better and faster. The second innovation we are trying to refine and perfect and use more often is obviously thermal drone imaging. It is not new because obviously Everybody loves technology and everybody's trying to get on board. Um, but we have refined our methods and koalas are hot and they leave a beautiful heat signature, which I'm hoping this video. So, so this is an example of the drone pilot uh, operator flying the drone and we can spot heat signatures, which in this case is this little white blob here. And what the drone operator does is he flies the drone over the bushland systematically. And what he can do is when he finds a white blob, he can <laughs> fly the drone above, circle, and try and accurately determine what that blob is. In this case, you can clearly see it's a koala. Um, and by doing this, we're also improving our detections. Um, and the next day, we send out the dog team to, again, confirm the detection and also co um, pick up koala scats that we find. Oh, it just wants to keep going. And as you can tell, during the day, we might miss this. <laughs> um, and I've been talking about koala scats, and as a scientific team, we are obsessed with koala scats. <laughs> it's not glamorous work, but it's great data. Um, and we use, do this by using our fresh koala scat detection dog, Billie Jean. Um, she's trained to get, uh, sorry, target scats that are less than a week old. And the reason we do this is that this koala scat actually has some koala DNA on it. And we collect this to look at things like koala genetics, how connected they are, what diseases they have, who they're reproducing with. We can also look at their diet and sort of the nitrogen value within the scats. And recently we've been looking at their adrenal responses. So how their physiology changes in relation to the environment and um, what they're experiencing. So the DDC has been working in the Redlands as a whole since 2018. Um, we've been monitoring koala populations in t since 2019. Um, we've established sentinel sites. So these are sites that we can monitor over time repeatedly. And we're um, working with council to promote koala safe neighborhoods. So this is an incentive to make koalas more visible to suburbia and for them to take ownership of recording data and taking care of their koalas, especially those in their own backyards. So our work here on the island is very special to us all. You'll probably talk to some of the PhD students and they'll tell you that the work we've done here is probably some of the proudest. Um, 
And these were the three aims. They seem pretty, I guess, basic, but oh, this has a life of its own. Um, but understanding koalas distribution is the first step to understanding their population health and then engaging community to make sure that they are one, know where they are and protecting them into the future. So here is the very first genetic pilot study that we did in the Redlands. So we also did it on the mainland as well as here on the island. In yellow here are the dog tracks. So this is how we record where the animals have been. In the middle is a map of the presence of scats that we found in green and the absence. And then we also have a map of chlamydia from the Redlands in the island. And you can tell on the island there's very little compared to the mainland. Um, we also use the detection dogs to confirm presence after the 2018-2019 bushfire that came through the island. Um, and we did this to ensure that, make sure that there were areas that um, koalas hadn't been completely wiped out in that area. Um, and as you can tell, the green dots, we did find some presence, which was a relief to make sure, you know, that they hadn't been completely wiped out. Um, and we also started droning on Minjerba in December 2020. Now, this was the first landscape scale drone surveys for the island. Um, this was quite early on in our droning sort of um, journey, I guess. Um, we covered 1,100 hectares. We detected 117 koalas at 44 sites. And we calculated density. And then we extrapolated this to the regional ecosystems on the island. And we produced this map here on uh, the far right. <laughs> the darker green areas are areas where we would consider higher densities that we found during the surveys. Red area, obviously, where there's a lot less. And as you can tell, it's mostly in the center of the island, which overlaps with the sand mining, and down in the south, which is the area that pretty much got quite burnt out by that fire that had passed by. So it's not surprising, but this was sort of our first mapping, and we were quite excited by this. And then we also got the opportunity to get involved with Kayak and WWF to look at um, cultural burning on the island. It's obviously a practice that's been done. Fire is also an important threat to koalas. Obviously, this is an island. Um, we are restricted by the boundaries of the geographic boundaries of the island. Therefore, we wanted to look at what, how do koalas respond to fire? And so we had this opportunity and we were very happy. And in 21-22, we um, surveyed five sites using a before and after control impact design. And this essentially means we got to survey before and after using sites that were unburnt and burnt. So we did 20 flights. Um, we detected koalas 225 times. And with these detections, we also went out and collected the scats. This was a lot of swamp and bush bashing and uh, removing thousands of ticks afterwards. Um, and we tested the effect of density. So looking at whether the culture burns had any effect on their density, on their adrenal response. So therefore, were they a little bit more stressed or not? And on their genetic diversity, we found no evidence of this, i.e. the cultural burns were low and slow and burnt patchily enough that the koalas were pretty happy to stay where they were, come in and out, breed successfully, keep living their lives. And now this raised the question of, well, can we use cultural burning to mitigate fire impacts? So things like the 2019, 2020 mega bushfires, um, can we reduce the load? Can practices such as this help into the future? And it's this idea of using fire to fight fire. Now, the consensus on this is still out. Um, there's a big debate between scientists whether this is the right thing to do based on climate change, but we are still crunching the data and we'll see how much more we can pull out of this. And lastly, um, this is one, one of our funnest little projects that we do is the Koala Urban Count. A few of you might have been on this where Redland City Council uses citizen science scientists to uh, spot and count the number of koalas they find. The team comes in after this, the citizen scientists, and we go to the locations, and we also count 
the koalas and also um, collect their scats. So this table here on the right is a culmination of all the data we've collected um, in the townships. And we also compared it to the bushland koalas. And the main thing I want to pull out is there are some really good sex ratios there. They're almost one to one. And in even some cases, there's more females to males. Mm -hmm. And the uh, number of chlamydia positive animals is very low. Um, which is one just shows the power of citizen science Two, the population here on Minjeriba is quite strong. It is an isolated population, but it is an island. But being said, it is one of the most genetically diverse populations compared to other island populations for koalas. Um, and lastly, from here, obviously, everybody needs funding for koalas. <laughs> it's forever a uh, hamster wheel for us, but we would love to keep at it. Uh, we absolutely cherish the fact that collecting, sharing and collaborating data is the only way forward to making sure that we're doing something, something sensible for koalas. Um, and therefore, into the future, we hope to collaborate with you guys more. Thank you. I did forget to actually say that Rahman was so, so sad not to actually be here. She was so, so sad. So just know that for those of you that know her, uh, the timing was not uh, in her favour. So I'd like to invite our next two speakers up, Paulie and Jody. Paulie's got more than 20 years of on-ground experience, not only working with wildlife, so anything wildlife, he knows all about it. If you need a snake removed, need your lawn cleaned as well, he's your man for it. Jody. <laughs> Jodie is also working um, very locally and she's worked right across Queensland and the country, so comes in with a wealth of experience. So I really look forward to hearing from you both. Come forward. You can use that. Okay. Just okay. We're good. Can I go? No, not Lee. <laughs> G'day guys, um, for those that don't know me, my name's Paulie. Um, I've been rescuing wildlife in the island for over 20 years, which is, um, it's my passion and my, my whole life basically, so yeah. Um, I'm Jody. I'm the president of Wildlife, wow, well, there's a lot of people. Um, the president of Wildlife Rescue Manjuraba, North Stradbroke Island, and I'm a volunteer rescuer and I'm normally <clears throat> out and about with Paulie. Um, we rescue animals better than we do this, so if you can bear with us, that'd be, that'd be great. Um, first and foremost, we'd like to acknowledge the Kwandamuka people. This is Kwandamuka land that we are gathering on today. And Paddy, if you're still here, thanks for the smoking ceremony and the welcome to country. Um, we pay our respects to the elders, past, present and emerging. Okay. All right, so Wildlife Rescue Manjuraba, we are an independent organization. Um, we, are, we are just humans wanting to help rescue wildlife. Uh, we rely on donations from the community to run. Um, every now and then we jump in and try and source funding. Everyone needs funding. We need it for equipment. Um, it takes a lot of equipment to rescue um, animals, especially koalas. Their cages aren't cheap. Um, we're available 24-7, 365 days a year, whether it's in the middle of um, Christmas lunch or... <laughs> Yep. Burgers at the pub. Yep. Um, we rescue any and all sick or injured, orphaned wildlife, land and sea. So we cover everything. And since records from 2017, we have attended over 500 koala rescues. It's a lot of rescues on a, um, on a little island. Okay, so um, we are unique. A few of our challenges we face, um, being a beautiful island with abundance of wildlife makes us a tourist attraction. Um, the island gets crowded with humans, vehicles and dogs on weekends and school holidays. So at the moment, we have no vet. Um, we've got no hospital on the island. Um, 
So once we rescue a koala, um, I've got to assess it, see what medical treatment it needs. Um, then we've got to organise logistics. So you can imagine on an island, it's not easy. So we're running with taxis, everything's to time. Um, so thank, thank you for the, like the straighty flyer. I think without those guys, it'd be stuffed, absolute legends. Um, there's been cases where they've held a boat up for me, especially the last boat when we've taken the koala over. Um, so I could get home again and continue rescuing, you know. So they've waited 10, 15, 20 minutes for us. Um, and all the people getting on board were bloody awesome as well. So everyone understood what was going on. Um, where are we? Okay, so, yeah, we organise, we got to organise pickup um, in Cleveland. And my mate, Jono, is there somewhere? Where are you, Jono? Fellow over the back. So he picks up all our koalas. Doesn't matter what time. You know, if we've got to get them off the, off the, off the island with VMR or whatever, Jono's always there and always gets our gear back, which is, for us as a volunteer group, as you can imagine, cages are not cheap. You know, you're looking at $200 a cage. If we've got to send heat packs over, there's $50 to $100. Um, so John is an absolute bloody legend. I think it's been eight or ten years he's been helping us out. So thank you, John. Um, so most of our stuff goes to the RSPCA, and John is the fellow that takes it there. Um, also, we have no bridge. So as I said earlier, um, if we're in really dire need, um, we need something taken off the island for pain relief. We've got a koala hit by a car, attacked by a dog. Um, we call on VMR, which is our volunteer marine rescue. Um, they transport our koalas to Raby Bay, and then I make a phone call to Jono, tell him it's on the way, and Jono's there to sort it out, get it to RSPCA and get, get pain relief. Um, also, we've got no climbers on the island, which over town, uh, a lot of tree loppers, so you guys can sort of over town could rely on calling out um, climbers. We got nothing like that. So um, we rely mainly on koala poles. So that's our first first call. We use a pole. We've got two 13 metre poles and the 17 metre pole. Mm. I reckon 85% of the koalas we can get with the pole. Um, if, if we got one, yeah, that's really bloody stubborn, doesn't want to move, it's got a lot of injury, I'll call on um, a couple of businesses on the island, which is um, Rick Lewis and George Caruana. Rick Lewis runs Nordstrad. Um, Georgie, he's the local uh, tree lopper. So they bring the cherry pickers out, harness me up, take me up, pluck them out the tree, bring them down again. Um, absolute bloody legends. I don't know what we'd do without them, to be honest. Um, so, yeah, and the third option is we've got a koala trap. Um, we haven't had to take it out of the shed. We've been between Jodes, myself and Apple, my daughter, we've been pretty successful with the pole. As I say, if we can't get them with the pole, we go the cherry picker and we always seem to get them out the tree. So we're very lucky to have the support of the community as well as local businesses and various government departments. The coppers are always willing to come out and give us a hand if we need to stop traffic. Um, yeah, it's we're, we're pretty lucky. Okay, so threats to koalas um, on Manjurabar that we notice as a rescue group. Dog encounters are massive. Um, we have a big problem on this island with dogs off leads, chasing koalas, um, negative encounters with koalas. Um, yeah, dogs, dogs are big and everyone thinks that their dog won't chase a koala. Hmm. Um, vehicle strikes, dog encounters actually can lead to vehicle strikes. Um, we do get more than we really should or that we want. You expect some um, because we do get so busy. Um, we have a fair few vehicle strikes of koalas, which is, yeah, not good. Um, so disease, um, illness and injuries, I suppose, with that too. Um, we do have chlamydia on the island. Um, our older koalas do get all the things that 
old koalas get. They get, you know, eye problems, internal problems um, and injuries. We've got a fairly healthy population and they do fight, especially, well, they've started already. Koala season started early on the Three island. Already. So um, they do fall from trees, babies get tossed. It's, yeah, all kinds of injuries as well. Human harassment, this is one of my pet hates. Um, where we seem to be advertised as an island that come and have the wildlife experience. People forget they're actually wild life and you shouldn't be touching them. The amount of people I've had to pull up for going up because the koala's low on a tree, let's pat it. Yeah, no. Um, they <clears throat> like to crowd around. Um, we've actually had an instance where Paulie's been called out because people were crowding around a koala and he's had to, he's walked out, he's trying to get the people back. They just want to take a photo because they don't know how to use the zoom on a camera. Um, and he's had to run in and grab the koala because a dog or fleas come charging straight for it. So, and that's not an uncommon thing. It's, it's, yeah, they follow it. They, and then they stand in the path and then they all like a mother duck with ducklings, they're all following it. So it shoots onto a road, traffic's got to be stopped and it's the human factor is, yeah, Real it's, drama. yep. Right. Okay, what can we do? Um, encourage responsible dog ownership. So if I'm out, I see someone walking around, dogs are off the lead, I always politely ask them, you know, can you put your dog in the lead? There's wildlife around. I don't think there's any harm in that. Um, and, you know, explain the repercussions of what I've seen with wildlife, you know, what happens with dogs um, and wildlife. Um, where are we? So report um, problems with dogs. Also sort of council. We're getting on pretty well with the council at the moment. There's two young ladies that come over. Um, we had, I know it's not a koala, but the last incident was a, um, a grey roo, eastern grey, attacked on Deadman's Beach by a dog. Um, grabbed, crushed its head, held it under, really badly aspirated, um, bleeding, obviously had to be euthanised. Um, but those, I rung those guys up straight away and that was over the next day, giving out fines. I know it's a lot of people that go, you bugger, you know, we're getting fines, but keep your dogs on a bloody lead, you know, we're the ones that are out sorting it out. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so slow down and be aware when driving, day or night. So people go dawn, dusk, do you know what? Koala, koala season is normally sort of August, kicks in, end of December, January. Um, so we've had three um, rescues in the last three days, which is like the breeding season starting off already. So they're two months early now. So, you know, they're getting around day and night. Angie, absolute legend, the other day called me up about one going up the road. Where are you, Angie? <laughs> there she is. Um, stopped a dog attacking a koala, kept everyone back, tourist load of, a bus load of tourists. Thing, especially through breeding season, yeah. holiday season, Sunday nights seem to be massive where people are rushing to get that barge, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, mm. yeah it's, locals are aware, but yeah. the tourists just seem to be... Yeah, well, Ange, Ange pulled up a bloody bus load of people that all got out. Um, this koala nearly got hit by a car. You know, they're out taking photos of it, crowding it, putting it off its path where it wants to go. You know, an old fella, um, obviously you're getting chased by the um, new male that's moved into that area. So, yeah, no, top job. Um, righto, where are we? Okay, so, yeah, slow down day or night. It's It doesn't matter. You know, dusk or dawn, to me, it doesn't matter. You know, even your, your swampies and bits and pieces are out. Um, so if you're... If you do happen to witness a koala being hit, you know, report it and please wait for it. There's nothing worse than rocking up to a, 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 you know, a koala being hit by a car and there's no one there. You know, where, where the hell is it? Is it in the bush? Has it gone up a tree? So, you know, we're never far away. I think the longest we'll ever take is 15 to 20 minutes and we're there. 
day or night, doesn't matter. So always wait for them. That'll be great. Um, okay. So uh, be observant. So is something not right with a koala? You know, if you spot something, doesn't look right, you know, does it look skinny? You know, malnutrition, bits and pieces, you know, there could be something going on with it. Um, do the eyes look okay? You know, has it got a wet bum? Just give us a ring. We'll go and check it out. Is it hunched over? Which is like the biggest sign, as koala people know, you know, there's dramas going on with them. Just report to wildlife. Any wildlife, we'll be over here, over town. Just just do the right thing and call it in. Um, yep. And educate. And education. Like that is, you know, that's the key. So, yeah. So basically it's going to take all of us working together to help protect our koalas from federal, state, local, um, traditional owner groups, um, individuals. It's going to take everybody um, working together. Everyone um, has all different um, research studies, backgrounds, experience. Um, it's going to take everybody. Otherwise, we won't have koalas for, you know, generations to come. They'll just be gone and all we'll be doing is patting really weird feeling stuffed ones stuffed like ones. that. That was weird. <laughs> <laughs> that was really, it was like koalas don't they feel, don't like, feel that. like that. <laughs> just, just saying. But, yeah, and it looked, that's what Emily said, they, it looks scary. They do look, it looks scary. But it's good for people that have never touched one before, but they don't actually feel like that, like in real life. It's freaky. All anyway, right. guys, thanks for your time. I'm sure we would all agree that Paulie and Jody did an absolutely fabulous job of speaking. So give them another round of applause. Our next speaker has been working on koalas for more than seven years. She has a master, and it's a big long name, of veterinary conservation medicine, which is really quite an impressive undertaking because I understand that is still quite a unique science. Like vets aren't necessarily trained on our native animals. And I think we are still only just learning more about those animals today. So today, Megan's going to share what it really is like as they come into her care. So thank you, Megan. So hi everyone, um, thank you for having me here today. Um, my name's Megan, I'm one of the wildlife vets at the RSPCA Queensland's Wildlife Hospital in Waco. Um, we treat a huge range of wildlife over there from all over Brisbane, including animals that have been rescued and brought over from Minjeriba. Um, each day at work, I'm mostly treating critically sick and injured animals. Um, and today I'm gonna share a bit about how we go about treating one of the most challenging cases that we have to treat as a wildlife vet, um, and that is treating dog attack injuries in koalas. Um, so at the RSPCA, dog interactions are the fourth most common cause of affliction for koalas um, after chlamydia, car hits, and under threat. Um, so it still makes up about 10% of all koala admissions, um, so it's quite a major threat to koalas. Males and females are equally affected um, and it mostly occurs early in the morning or late in the evening um, when koalas are most active. We generally see these injuries happen in koala breeding season. So for us, it's usually between June to November that we see a lot of koalas um, because they're on the ground, they're moving about to trying to find mates. Um, and that's when they move through people's backyards and have those dog interactions. Unfortunately, the mortality rate that we see um, is around 67%. So that's of animals that actually make it to the hospital. So if we were to include animals that don't make it and aren't able to be rescued, then that number is probably quite a bit higher. Um, so in terms of koalas coming from the island here, um, similar statistics in that dog attacks are the fourth most common reason um, for animals to, for the koalas to make it to the RSPCA hospital from here. Um, with orphaned koalas being the most common reason that we see for admission. 
Um, obviously, those koalas are rescued over here. They have to be transported by the ferry, picked up um, on the other side by one of our volunteer rescue drivers, usually John Knights, um, that brings them over to the hospital. So it's quite a journey before they get to the RSPCA and we can treat them. Um, so unfortunately, the mortality rate for dog attack injuries and in koalas from Injeriba is around 75%. Um, but this is um, a successful story that I wanted to share with you today. So this is Winnie, um, and she's a three-year-old female koala um, that was attacked by a dog over here. She was rescued, um, and she was actually triaged by the vet on the island. So Jade actually treated her and gave her an initial um, pain relief and antibiotics before she was transferred over to RSPCA. She ended up spending over two months in care with us. Um, and made a full recovery. So she was a really nice story. Um, and I'll come back to her um, story a little bit later. So why are dog bite injuries such a difficult thing to treat? And they're quite difficult in any species to treat, not just wildlife, um, but koalas have a few features that make them particularly difficult patients. So I've put a picture of an iceberg up on this slide um, because like an iceberg, which is small on top and huge underneath, under the water, a dog bite injury is what we call an iceberg effect. So often when the animals come into us, um, they don't have particularly severe injuries on the outside. So they might just have a little bit of bruising, maybe a couple of scratches and one or two puncture marks. Um, sometimes they have absolutely no wounds whatsoever. There's just some saliva on them. Um, but what's happening under the skin is usually much, much more severe. Um, so dogs have a really strong bite force. So they do what we call a crush injury, um, which is where the tissue, so the skin and the blood vessels and the muscle and internal organs get crushed for a period of time. And that causes tissue hypoxia, which is a lack of oxygen to the tissues. Um, and those tissues start to die back. And as those tissues die back, they release some toxic metabolites um, and enzymes and things that can get into the bloodstream of the animal and can also cause the tissue around that bite to start to die back as well. So what we see on the first day when the koala arrives in our care is often the, not the full extent of the injury. And after the next two to three days, the wound that initially looked not too bad can start to look very, very severe. Um, I've written the size of the dog doesn't necessarily correlate to the severity of the injuries. So sometimes our smaller dogs are actually more likely to go for a koala just because of the nature of the dog. And I love dogs. I don't want to villainize dogs at all. Um, but unfortunately, these um, interactions do happen. And then the thing that further complicates these injuries is that a dog's mouth is so full of bacteria that when it does bite a koala, um, the tooth punctures in through the skin and introduces a whole lot of bacteria into the wound. Um, and these bacteria are anaerobic, which means that they thrive in a low oxygen environment. So when they get under the skin, that's a really good environment for them to grow and cause a really nasty bacterial reaction and infection. And then we have some koala factors. So um, the wounds that we see in koalas when they get bitten by a dog, mostly occur around the back end as the koala is presumably trying to run away from the dog. Um, so we see bites over the back legs, the rump and the abdomen, and occasionally the thorax and the neck as well. Unfortunately for koalas, they don't have a lot of protection around their bodies. So compared to other animals of a similar size, koalas got no, basically no fat, um, very little subcutaneous tissue um, and very small amount of muscle. They also have really weak ribs compared to other animals that size, so their internal organs are really susceptible to getting damaged by a dog bite. They also have an organ called a cecum, so koalas are what we call hindgut fermenters, um, and so they have this giant intestinal sac, basically, full of bacteria and fungi that help the koala to digest its leaves. Um, and it's a really important organ that if it gets damaged by a dog bite, for example, um, it actually stops working, and that's detrimental to the koala. The microbiome is so delicate <laughs> in this cecum that when we use antibiotics to treat um, dog bite injuries, 
it can cause side effects that help that disrupt that microbiome and then that can lead to dysbiosis which is where the cecum just stops working again detrimental to the koala I'm sorry if anyone's squeamish, um, but this is a picture of doing surgery on a koala that's been bitten by a dog. Um, so as you can see, there's quite a bit of damage there. Um, what looks like a dog puncture, but it hasn't actually punctured all the way through at that stage. But if we left it, it would rupture and the sequel contents, so all those bacteria and things would leak into the abdomen and cause what we call a septic peritonitis, which is an abdominal infection. It is very difficult to treat. Um, so what we have to do is actually cut that damaged tissue out and then sew the ends of the cecum back together again, which is quite an extensive surgery. Um, so what do we do to treat these really difficult patients? So the first thing we do when they come into our hospital is to stabilise them. They're usually suffering from a lot of blood loss, so they're in shock. They can be septic already if it's been a day or two since they were bitten by a dog. Um, so we will put them on IV fluids. We have um, a lot of blood machines at RSPCA that we can actually run blood tests to see if they have any underlying disease, um, any electrolyte abnormalities or any other changes that end up happening to affect the health of these animals. Um, we put them on pain relief. That's really important because obviously these injuries are very painful. Um, and luckily at RSPCA, we have nurses on 24-7 so they can be monitoring the pain levels of these koalas and adjusting as needed. Um, and often, you know, it's quite a number of days that they're in intensive care. Um, we do a thorough vet check under a full general anaesthetic because, as I mentioned, these wounds can be very tricky, um, very sneaky, and often you can't really see the full extent until you've got the animal under anaesthetic. We use tools such as ultrasound and x-ray. Um, so on ultrasound, we can see if there's any internal blood loss and any damage to the bladder or the kidneys or anything like that. Um, liver lacerations is also something that's quite common. On x-ray, we can see if there's any fractures. So rib fractures are really common. Um, any punctures to the lungs or anything like that that we need to treat. And then we also do a test, which is what this picture is up here, um, called an abdominocentesis, which is where we take a little sample of the abdominal fluid and look for blood or bacteria. So if there's a lot of blood, it could mean that there's an organ that's been lacerated and is bleeding. Um, and if there's a lot of bacteria, usually it means that that cecum's been damaged. Um, and in the picture up here, that should be like clear with just a couple of the um, purple cells, which are called mesothelial cells, they're normal. Um, but it's got lots and lots of little red blood cells, which are the um, pink small cells there. So that koala is obviously has some internal bleeding um, and that's something that we need to treat and monitor for. Um, so then obviously the wound management of these dog bite injuries, um, looking for the saliva, looking for any punctures or anything like that. We need to make sure that we've assessed the full extent of the wounds and not just what's on the surface. Um, so when they're under anaesthetic, we'll probe. Sometimes we open the wound right up to see what kind of muscle damage is underneath. And then we flush the wound out with lots and lots of saline to get rid of all of that bacteria and prevent an infection from happening. Um, sometimes we don't suture them up straight away because if the wound's gonna get worse over the, you know, sort of the next couple of days, you could fix the wound and then two or three days later, it all falls apart and it's a much bigger wound. So we can bandage it initially, and then we'll go back in and revise and suture as much as we can. Sometimes we can't suture the wounds up and we'll just bandage them. And there's a few different techniques that we can do that prevent um, restricting the animal's movement too much. Because koalas, if they can't move around a tree very well, they can get depressed very easily and don't cope very well in care. We can also place drains in large, in large wounds. So um, a drain is like a little tube that actually goes inside the wound and it prevents a bacterial infection from happening by helping to drain out any fluid. Um, antibiotic use is really difficult, as I mentioned with their cecum that is quite finicky and sensitive to antibiotics. Um, so we have sort of a max maximum of five days that we can have them on the type of antibiotics that will treat dog bite wounds. Um, and so we do that intravenously so we can get those levels of antibiotics quite high and 
get them into the tissues without any side effects on the cecum. Um, I really like to use topical antibiotics. So that's like ointments and treatments, um, things like flamazine, uh, manuka honey is also really good, and some different types of bandaging materials that actually have antibiotics in them that um, really help with that wound treatment. And then obviously we have to monitor for the side effects affecting the cecum and the microbiome. Um, so back to Winnie. So she, as I mentioned, she was stabilised over here um, on some pain relief and antibiotics. When she got to RSPCA, she was put onto IV fluids to help stabilise her, um, uh, her shock. And then under anaesthetic, it revealed that she had some scratches to her abdomen, um, but nothing very severe on the outside. We did uh, the abdominocentesis check, um, and there was some evidence that there was some bacteria in her abdomen, so there was some leaking from her cecum. So we took her to surgery, so I had to do a full surgery on her. There was a little bit of damage to the cecum, but enough that we could treat it um, and flushed as much of it as possible to try and get all of that bacteria out of her abdomen. Then she had, you can sort of see the bandage down on her tummy um, while she was in care. She would have been on antibiotics. She was on pain relief. She was under supportive care for quite a long period of time. Um, and then after two months in hospital, she was moved to a larger rehabilitation yard um, and successfully released. That was fantastic. Um, so the key message I guess I wanted to get across to everyone today was that time is quite critical with dog bite wounds. Um, the sooner we can start treating them, the more successful the outcome is going to be. Um, all dog interactions really should warrant a veterinary assessment because even if we have a look at them and go, I can't see any wounds, they look fine, there's a lot of hidden wounds and a lot of hidden damage that can be under the surface. We obviously need to encourage responsible pet ownership. Um, there's a few different programs trying to help people to train their dogs to um, leave the koalas and not attack them. Um, and koala safe yards are really important so that when a koala goes into a yard, they can escape and not get attacked by a dog. So that's all. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Well, I'm sure like myself, you've already learned a lot from our speakers. So don't forget to actually put any of your questions into Slido. So please do put your uh, phone up and remember any of the questions for these first speakers now go into that and we will have a panel after our next two speakers have actually spoken. So there is the Slido in case you actually need it for Q&A. But don't forget anything, just pop it in there. They would love to hear from you and to actually talk more about these when we actually come back. But for now, have a quick brain break. Everyone needs it. Stand up, stretch, have a chat, walk around. We'll be back in 10 minutes time. All right, everybody. What a wonderfully compliant audience you actually are. Usually I have to really work hard to pull everyone back in after a break. Um, thank you. I hope you're enjoying it all so far. I'd like to introduce our next speakers. They're from Kayak, Dan Carter and Darren Burns. And they're going to give you a bit of a background on Kayak and the work that they actually do, including conservation of koalas, bushfire sort of management and so on. So I'm going to hand over to them now. Thank you. <laughs> Darren and I started the other day looking at this while we're choosing which, which, which koala represented which one of us. So. <laughs> Steve, our CEO, is calling me a koala now anyway. So, so um, yeah, welcome to Minjaraba. Uh, this presentation will go through a bit of what Kayak's doing and, and the work that we've been doing recently with the koala drone work, thanks to the funding of WWF, DESI. Um, and we'll work we're doing with the robot, Roboto as, as we speak. So caring for country and caring for the, excuse my um, pronunciation, Dumbiripi in action is the t name and the title of the, the presentation that we're looking at. Darren, do you want to talk about your, we'll just, don't need to talk to the slides. Yeah, thanks Dan. Um, First, I'll pay my respects to um, my elder. I've got an elder in the room here today. Um, and 
I want to pay my respects also to Paulie. Uh, he's total saviour, the work that he does, getting up in the middle of the night. Before Paulie, it was Jack Jackson. So we've got these, you know, totally dedicated people who get out there and, you know, do the the salvation for these koalas, the, the researchers that do their bits, you know. So it's... It's great. My son up the back there, he, he works in the feral animal control. He's taken 10 dogs, itinerant dogs, out of the bush. So they're not, they're not township dogs. They're dogs that people just come over here and leave here that just are off the radar, that get around killing wildlife. Um, my granddaughter, Elkie, his daughter, has got a little wildlife warrior shirt on and she's looking at all you science people and conservation people today and that's, I think, her target. That's where she's heading. Um, we've got some local ecologists who work with us um, at Kwanamooka also that are totally invaluable. The work that Jade's done over the years and she's building up her vet clinic now. And So, you know, I think what I'm trying to say is, you know, this big group of people that care for Burrabi um, and in our culture, Burrabi is like a little creature who lives in the trees and in our folklore and our custom um, has a special place out there. Um, you're hearing grunting and groaning in the night and moving around in the bush. Um, so before we have all of this development and what we've got now, there was a, a connection between the traditional owner people and those those creatures out there, the kangaroos, the wallabies, the, the koalas. Um, but now we have all of what we have, so it's just we have the ecologists, we have the scientists, we've got the rescuers, um, you know, Kayak, our CEO, Steve Wright's here today, such as, such as our investment in the koalas and, and the future here on the island for the conservation of the island. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, it's a privilege to be with, you know, such a great group of people. Um, but that's all I say for now. Thank you. <clears throat> The kayak recognises the koala as one of only two naturally island populations in Australia. The population has been isolated on from the mainland for approximately 8,000 years. The population density currently is unknown. There's some really way out there population density estimates that go from 30 odd up to 700 koalas. But the data we're showing seems to be a lot more high density than that. And we're improving in time understanding of the distribution and of those koalas across the across the country. What we're going to focus on is wildfire and the bushfire threats that we're facing the koalas here. So when Kayak and we looked at the data and the statistics we saw and recognised following the, large, the big wildfires recently, probably the key threat to wipe out a large proportion of the population in a single event is wildfire. In 2014, bushfire, 70% of the island burnt. 2018, 80-mile swamp fire. 2019, the Amity swamp fire. The impact on koala population was really unknown. They did the initial work that Roman showed earlier with the scats, which picked up koalas in that southern end, which hadn't been picked up previously. This frequent high-intensity fires have changed the vegetation communities. So if you look across the landscape, we're now getting more of a thick shrubby understory, which is carrying those wildfire events into the canopy, which is really that threat. So you'll see the work that Kwandamuga people are doing currently with the TFMS in reducing that fuel load across and, and opening, that, opening up that understory to more of a grassy focus. <clears throat> so Minjaraba and Kayak have developed the Minjaraba Kwandamuga Jalo Fire Project, which covers mostly the Nari Bajong National Park. We've also developed the Township Fire Management Strategy. The B's two documents form a, a whole of island fire management approach. It's tenure blind, which is the first time I think in, a, in, all of, in Australia, if not Queensland, may, definitely in Queensland. So we've ignored the boundaries of Redland City Council, we've ignored the boundaries of the Department of Resources, we've ignored the boundaries of, of QPWS, recognising that native title exists across the entire landscape and developed that fire management strategy focused on protecting the life and property assets of the townships, but also to improve and enhance the ability to do wildfire or planned burns across the entire landscape. 
there's going to be a shift in vegetation community types over time. We can't just do this overnight because there's been 200 years of colonisation where it's eliminated appropriate and due fire practices. <clears throat> koala and bushfire management. Managing fires and koalas. We build upon the knowledge of the koala di distribution across the island. Transect surveys for humans, scat surveys, bit of human and dog, detection dog surveys, and the UAV and drone surveys. The picture above is some recent work that we did with Jeff Lunky Jenkins' team and Scientific, where they walked those transects through that area at, at Flinders. They only found one koala. The area below is what we found with the drone work. If you had the privilege of trying to walk through that bush and actually look for these koalas, it was almost impossible. I joined the, universe, the Sunshine Coast team after they'd done drone work looking for scats. Um, I'm not a bad koala spotter, but I couldn't find them at all. So it um, shows the value of using the drone and that technology to do it, let alone walking through that country, especially that m and &E Flinders, you're in and out of swamps. So, so just at that point of the conversation, I just want to raise a couple of things. Um, the earlier presentation that we've seen today um, touched on will cultural burning help the koalas? And I heard it said that either oh, the science, the jury was still out on that. Now, that's a contradiction on top of a paradox um, because you might have heard what Dan's just said. Because of those 200 years that traditional burning hasn't been done in the bush, that's why the bush is like it is today and it's getting worse. So we're not just doing cultural burns, we're actually out there mowing this bush down in lieu of being able to burn it because you can't have a controlled burn today. You try to do a cultural burn like a tribal Aboriginal would have done 200 years ago, you're going to have the same result as a kid walking around with a box of matches. It just goes boom. So we can't really do cultural burns. We've got to do something in between. We've got to do manual reduction and we've got to not put fire into some of this bush because it's just going to go berserk because it's, it's not set up for that. So um, I just wanted to, to put that point in there. I think it's two years ago, an opportunity knocked on Kayak's door in relation to a funding opportunity with DESI. Um, at the same time, USC also did a funding opportunity with WWF. It was such a good project. We, for the first time ever, we actually had both company, both organisations support and fund that project. So that was this cultural burning and understanding that landscape and use of the drone technology. I was meant to bring the paper, but I was busy out flying drones yesterday. So. Out of that work, we quickly learnt the Flinders swamp burn, we had a large swamp burn that we wanted to do. It was take 12, 13 years since fire. We had high groundwater table and we know on primary koala habitat. We just didn't know how much was koala density in that environment. In June 22, USC gratefully flew the area, picked up 52 koalas, which I think was their, first, their, their record density of koalas in that time. It highlighted the risk of the koalas and required a revision to the burn plan. We went back to the drawing board in relation to what we were wanting to do and how we we're going to burn that block. It revised the resources and we included, in, given the population, we engaged Jeff's and Desi's koala team to come and assist and understand the risk and the threats. In July, uh, we had Q Queensland Fire and Rescue's um, drone tech team come out and we flew it, flew, it, flew it before the fire event. We found another 40, we found 48 koalas during that flight. We mapped, used to brief and highlight to all the people on the ground, the level and the density of koalas in that environment. We had two water bombers on standby, not just from a residential perspective, but from a koala management perspective, so that if it was gonna get hot and go into that koala habitat, we were able to water bomb it straight away. We had Paulie and his team on standby. We had actually a vet here from Desi and a vet from Karamban. We had one koala who was injured. So this is us flying the first night with Desi, um, with the Queensland Fire and Rescue. You've seen a bit of this shot, the koala there and that blob.
you see another one pop up on the right of the screen. During the fire, we put um, incendiary helicopter out through the middle of the swamp and ignited through there. This is what the uh, drone operation in terms of fire management allows us to do in terms of understanding where the fire front is um, and to go in using that information back to the teams on the ground and the incident control to make better decisions on ground as to what's happening. So that fire, I think the day that we lit it up, we had rain that morning. Um, it was perfect conditions in relation to just letting that swamp burn through there. There's the team. There's a shot of Paulie's back there. We were bringing down a koala that got a bit singed, unfortunately. Um, we cared and rescued for that and then released it. Uh, that's the incendiary helicopter in the middle, the debriefing in the, to the right. Um, that area where the kayak officer is putting down, there was a koala in that tree, so we put water around it to protect it. Not only you see koalas, you would see other wildlife. <laughs> Little glider. <coughs> The beauty of the drone work also is allowed us to follow up behind and actually see what was the koala density post fire. We didn't really see much significant change in those numbers. Funding from WF has allowed Kayak now to purchase our own N300 drone, which you saw outside. It's now allowed to train Quantum Mega staff to actually fly that drone. So we've got five or six staff who are now authorised and approved to actually fly. And we're probably the first Indigenous organisation to get a re commercial REOC licence to fly drones at night and undertake that activity. So a significant undertaking by our staff. Our chief pilot is Ryan Kuzrak. Uh, he's had to work his backside off to go cover that and to meet the oblig obligations under CASA's rules. We're now working with Roboto, who are here today. So I'm looking tired because we've been flying for the last week or so day and night, trying to get as many koalas as we can to create an AI program that would allow us to automatically send the drone up, identify the koalas, record it and document it. So, yeah. Um, and Roboto, as part of the process with WWF, will provide us a, their background is developing a, a fire AI program which will map and provide up-to-date maps in terms of the fire um, lines and fire hotspots, which will again assist us in day-to-day -day fire management upon the island. <clears throat> Conclusion for kayak, protection and management of Minjeriba koala is important. Use of cultural and modern technology to protect cultural koalas on country. We're only just seeing the start of what the use of the drone technology here on Minjeriba and what it can deliver for us improving our understanding and knowledge of koalas across the island. And using this knowledge to mitigate bushfire risk to these animals, not just koalas, but also the gliders and every other species out there. So, Darren, you'd be able to um, Yeah, thanks, Dan. I pay my respects to Dan too. He's since coming over from the mining company. Dan's been our principal science officer. He's, he's led all of our science associated works excellent and I know we've got to wrap up so I just want to pass on that appreciation to all of the partners in this room um, and I hope you can appreciate Kayak's efforts in this space and you know hopefully we're really coming together you know um, I see Simo representatives here Simo was doing the, the hard yards back when nobody cared um, so we're all still in this together so it's great thank you and thank Dan. Uh, thank
Thank you very, very much, Darren and Dan. That was a really great talk. Now, our final speaker for today is Jeff Lundy Jenkins. Jeff works for the Department of Environment, Science and Innovation, and he comes with more than 35 years of experience, probably more than he would care to admit, working across not only koalas, but all forms of wildlife. His job today is a lot of strategic oversight work, including working on the 2020 to 2025 uh, Queensland koala strategy. So Jeff, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Sharon, and thanks everyone again for for, for coming and and particularly acknowledging the other partners and and presenters this morning. Um, also, would like to again add my um, acknowledgement to the traditional owners of the country and what we're meeting the Kwandamuka people and pay my respects to elders, past, present, and emerging, and acknowledge ongoing connection to land, sea, sky, and country, and particularly acknowledging that presentation by by Dan and Darren and the real strong focus on collaboration and the efforts to, to collaborate in this space to help conserve our koalas. I'll set a bit of a scene in terms of where we're at, where we're at in terms of the, the Queensland Government's response to circumstances for koalas. Back in 2015, um, University of Queensland researchers analysed a whole range of data and that indicated that despite ongoing efforts and planning by Queensland Government and a range of other entities that koala populations in South East Queensland were still declining. So despite significant investment and effort, there were still koala populations in decline and we were losing koala populations. That led to the establishment of an, an expert panel by government that brought together science experts, planning experts, people involved in animal care and welfare to look at the circumstances, review the the current approaches and made some strong independent recommendations to government. That expert panel came out with eight core cool recommendations uh, to Queensland government. Queensland government then formulated a, a, a response to that, essentially accepting all those recommendations and, and proposing a way forward. And there's two key elements to that, that way forward, which was introduced in 2020. And that was a commitment to introduce new and stronger protections for koala habitat in South East Queensland and the intention to both develop and implement a overall conservation strategy for, for koalas in South East Queensland. Those new habitat protection laws were introduced early in, in 2020 and that involved significant review and amendment to the planning regulation, to the nature conservation koala conservation plan and to the environmental offsets framework. And it was supported by new state-of-the-art koala habitat mapping, which was consistent methodology across the whole of South East Queensland, where prior to that there'd been disparate maps by different local government areas identifying koala habitat in different ways. This is just an example of that, that new koala habitat mapping. So the koala habitat mapping identifies both areas of koala habitat. It identifies koala priority areas, which are the large contiguous areas of koala habitat, which offer the best prospects for conserving large um, sustainable populations of koalas. The mapping also identifies, and this is the yellow areas, identifies areas for koala habitat restoration. So that looks at form of vegetation cover and land condition and proposes areas that are suitable and priorities for restoration. We've also more recently also started to undertake and have prepared koala threat mapping. So we've overlaid all the key threats to koalas to identify areas where koala populations are subject to threats. And all this mapping not only informs the planning uh, changes, but also informs how we invest and progress our conservation action. So the koala conservation strategy was introduced in uh, August in 2020. Um, it delivers on the, the expert panel's recommendations. In 2022-2023, the Queensland Government announced an, an, um, new funding, so it committed $24.6 million over a four-year period to accelerate and expand actions under that strategy. So some of the 
projects I'll cover in a very rapid fire way today uh, how that money has been spent. There's a, annual reports have been prepared in terms of how that um, strategy is being implemented and they're available online. Some of the sort of core highlights I'll try and cover today. Please catch me afterwards if you've got particular questions around areas that uh, are of, of interest or, or you want more information. A key part of the koala conservation strategy was that it set some pretty ambitious targets. When the first draft of the strategy came out, the community and a lot of stakeholders came back and said, you haven't gone hard enough. You, you really are just um, playing at the edges of this. So the targets that are now set within the strategy reflect the feedback from the community to say, we want you to take this seriously. So the, the targets are to stabilise koala populations in southeast Queensland for a net gain in total core koala habitat, which given the level of development and impact in southeast Queensland is a very ambitious target to have uh, commence rehabilitation to restore 10,000 hectares of koala habitat in southeast Queensland and to, in terms of threat reduction, to commence 10 programs in threat priority areas to reduce the threats to koalas by 25%. So to, to stop those deaths associated with disease, injury, mortality rates in those key locations based on that important threat mapping. The strategy is built around six core action areas and there's a, there's a series of actions under each of those. It's around habitat protection, so the mapping and the new conservation measures under the Planning Act uh, are delivering primarily that, that outcome. Habitat restoration, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the work that we're doing to restore habitat in areas in partnership with a range of other groups. Threat management, again, as a number of the previous speakers have identified, there are a significant range of other threats over and above the removal of habitat that's impacting koala populations. We can continue to improve our mapping, our monitoring and research. So again, some of the presentations today flag the research that's being supported and the work that's being done. Community engagement is a key thing because there's acknowledgement that we can't do this alone, that it needs to be a collaborative effort. We need to leverage the support of the community and other organisations to, to be effective in this space. And that's that community engagement leads to those important partnerships and then very much strategic coordination so that we're all rowing and contributing in the same direction. Some key investment and achievements so far, and I'll probably go through these really rapid fire. So, um, in, as I said, the map, the, the new habitat protections have increased both the area and the level of protection for habitat in southeast Queensland. The state of the art mapping, which identifies not just the habitat, but the areas for restoration and the areas that uh, where koala populations are most at threat. We've invested to date over $4.48 million in habitat restoration, primarily through a partnership with the Queensland Trust for Nature, inviting private landholders to restore koala habitat on their land. We've run a range of uh, koala collab events to bring together experts and partners in the community. And these programs and forums that Griffith have been running are a, a follow on from that and complement those original collab events. We've invested $10.8 million plus in SEQ Wildlife Hospital uh, Network, and that includes support for RSPCA, Australia Zoo, Wildlife Hospital, um, for Corumban Wildlife Hospital, and also for the Mogul Koala Rehab Centre. In addition to that, we've also funded three rounds of wildlife carer grants to support the volunteers who invest their own time and money in, in rescue work. Um, the program we've been running with Griffith University, that's to date over a $1.2 million investment in doing co-design sessions with local governments and the community in running community engagement events, in doing breeding season campaigns to focus attention of the community on the threats to koalas during that time. We've funded many rounds of applied research grants to support the type of work that University of Sunshine Coast are doing with looking at scats and drones. We've invested in work to support the creation and deployment of koala chlamydia vaccines as an important response to that level of chlamydial disease. As part of the Griffith program, we've been promoting and, and extending some of the work on Leave It. So that's the training for dogs to in wildlife avoidance 
So a really important program in those areas where you've got dogs adjacent to areas supporting koalas or urban areas where koalas are living within that urban area. Um, we've just in the final stages of a major study to look at and identify key road strike hotspots across the whole of South East Queensland that allows us to then make decisions around where we should be strategically investing in infrastructure and other works to reduce road strike events. Um, we've uh, just funded a project which will be led by Healthy Land and Water and they've started engagement through workshops with the community and local governments to again feed local information in to identify where those threats are, what work we're already doing and how we can invest to complement that, that existing work. Um, there's been some talk about koala sightings. Again, we were successful in developing and launching a koala sighting app that works on the Q Wildlife platform as a basis for the community contributing data to help us identify where koalas are, what's impacting those koalas in, in, in our landscapes. That new funding and some further funding that we've attracted in the past six months will allow us to, to also expand in these other areas. Um, We've engaged with uh, Indigenous communities across South East Queensland and have developed a First Nations Koala Action Plan. Um, we're currently in discussions with Kayak about hosting a workshop here on Minjira Bar to bring together all the First Nations groups from across South East Queensland to talk about, learn from and to develop programs to work on country to help uh, do the type of work that uh, Dan and Darren talked about. Ongoing community awareness campaigns. Maggie's been sharing out in the foyer copies of the education and teacher packs that we've developed around koala conservation. We've got ongoing um, intent to run these types of forums to both support the community to understand what work's going on, but also hear about opportunities to support and participate. We're developing tools to refine and assist mapping. So we've engaged CSIRO to develop a habitat assessment tool. We're working with them to develop a hub to bring together all the monitoring data. So again, communities and um, the general public can get an understanding of koalas in their local areas. Um, we're expanding habitat mapping to go outside of the SEQ planning region into the SEQ bioregion. So again, that will introduce further mapping to support local governments in planning and, and implementing actions to support koalas. We're about to sign another contract with Queensland Trust for Nature and Healthy Land and Water to wrap up um, further areas of habitat restoration. And we're hopeful that in the next financial year, we'll also have grants for community groups to contribute in local restoration projects. We're doing targeted investment in other threat mitigation activities. Um, there's ongoing support and investment in research. We're, we're party to two collaborative research grants with the ARC to look at specific technologies and approaches to support koala conservation. And we continue to invest in the two Queensland unis who have led the way in terms of chlamydia vaccines. So they are now developed those vaccines to the point that they're ready to be registered such that they can be deployed to hospitals and used not for research purposes, but for recovery purposes in fighting the future of that disease impacting. I'll make some quick comments on the Commonwealth program because we're very fortunate in that whilst the koala has been listed as endangered, which is sad and unfortunate, the Commonwealth government has also leapt in to establish a national recovery team and a national recovery plan and have invested $76.9 million across that southeast range of the koala. And that's leading to some investment in four key areas in community grants, large habitat restoration projects, a national monitoring program and koala health care projects. There's over um, nearly 60 projects have been funded under the small grants part within Queensland. Um, there's been $12 million invested in four large habitat restoration projects in Queensland, um, going up to central Queensland, so around Carina and Mackay, inland into the Clark Connor Ranges, down around uh, Gympie, and then also in areas here within South East Queensland. My font died, but there's also been a significant investment in the health program. So again, the Commonwealth Government has helped fund the hospitals further and also invest further in the chlamydia vaccine research. So 
the summary is this new strict habitat protections and controls in place. There's a strategy which is directed by expert input and knowledge. Um, there's a strong focus on partnerships. And again, just acknowledge the partners that were here today that we've part funded and supported in some way, but are also dragging in other people to support uh, the work that's needed. There's significant progress, which is reflected in our annual reports. Um, that additional funding has been uh, very important in being able to do this sort of diverse portfolio of work around koalas. And it's been complemented by investment by the Australian government as well. Thanks. Okay, this moves us to the Q&A session and a chance to actually get all of our speakers up. So while Kim gets our speakers uh, very organised, um, I'm going to look around the room for Megan. Where is she? Megan Foster? She's standing right at the back there. Yeah, can you just uh, wave your hand? So everyone turn around, look at Megan. I just wanted to wave and she won't know why, the poor girl. Someone in the chat has actually said, how can we get help with dogs uh, so that we can help do prevention work around dogs? And the answer is, Megan actually looks after Leave It. She spends 100% of her time and works full time and runs around the southeast corner running events. So in the coming weeks, we can train dog trainers. We have our expert trainer, Steve Austin, who we first met back in 2016 when we'd never heard heard about this problem and your council, Redland City Council, is the one that helped lead the way on this. So through them, we actually learned that you can train dogs to avoid wildlife, just like you can train them to detect them. And so the training that we run for trainers and dog owners across the southeast corner is all about that. So if you're interested in learning more, there are a lot of events coming up from the dog trainer events to also a nine day challenge that we're running through Redland City Council. So anyone who owns a dog or knows someone else who's got one, this is all free to community, no cost to you. And then finally, there is actually a dog training app. So you can actually download if you're happy using tech and the app features Ryan Tate, who is also an expert trainer. He happened to be you know, trained by Steve and they take you through the steps, easy to follow. And I know some dogs are good dogs and just like people, some are bad dogs and they're a little bit harder, but they're all dogs. And really half of it's about training us in how to get the dog to do the command. Dogs are actually part of a pack and some of us need to step up and, and learn to lead our own dogs. So that's the first of our questions that I took on to answer. So again, do chat to me, like either Megan or myself, um, anyone else in the team, we would be more than happy to help. Now, if I could ask our speakers to all come up, please. And I'm going to actually pose my first question and forgive me if I can't get through these. There are so many questions that have actually come in from everybody, so thank you. So if everyone takes a seat, once you get a chance. Um, and if Rihanna, if I could get you to have the, the mic first. Um, there's a question here, volunteering opportunities in this space. Are there ways that people can get involved in the work that you're doing? 100%. Um, we are a university and we are don't ha always have the funding to fund all the work we do. So we do rely a lot on volunteers to come out with us. Um, obviously, we're a university, so we have to sign you up. But um, if you're very interested, please come to me um, and we would love to have you in the field with us. Fabulous. I have multiple questions around the numbers of koalas and I'm going to allow people here to decide who gets to answer what we do or don't know about this. But do we have any information on how many koalas live on Binjiraba? The short answer is no, with a high level of probability. So the one study that was done was funded by Redland City Council recently. <clears throat> That's the one that I quoted was population variability from I think just over uh, under a thousand to 40 koalas. So that's because of the error rate in relation to the statistical models and because of the areas searched and the density levels. So Rani would better explain how you would get that extrapolation, but there's no real number. And do we know how many koalas have left the island over the last three years? Oh, 
Yeah, we got the stats, but we didn't bring them with. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we can't answer at the moment. Yep. Just ask Paulie later on. He might yep. actually figure out where all the bits of paper are and be able oh, to actually... Oh, we know where the paperwork can, can is. I add a, just, can I yeah. add a comment to that as well, but? Um, I think it's, is it on? Yep. Um, there has been a lot of concern expressed about, I guess, koalas leaving the island in terms of getting care and then the issues about them returning to the island. Um, in looking at the actual numbers, probably the biggest problem facing koalas on the island is the number of koalas that actually get killed or are euthanized as a consequence of the injuries they receive on the island. And that is a far bigger number than any koalas that are actually removed or taken to be given care. The other thing I also want to emphasise is that the, the decision that was made to initiate a moratorium on returning animals to the island um, was based on serious concern with the potential for introduce of novel diseases into the koala population on the island. And as you would have seen from some of the research work that's there, there is a low level of disease within the Minjirabar koalas and it's a, it's a, a genuine concern that taking animals to the mainland where they're exposed to animals where there is a higher level of disease in those animals, there is a, a genuine concern about the risk of bringing animals back and introducing those diseases. So to address that, we are actually now working through and we have formalised a disease risk assessment and on the basis of that disease risk assessment have developed some quarantine protocols and assessment protocols. We're now um, in the early stages of uh, negotiating to host some of the traditional owners and other people from the island to come to the mainland and inspect our facilities to look at how those processes would operate in order to potentially establish a pathway to bring the animals that are received care back onto the island. So. <laughs> There, there are statistics, no, but I guess there, there are numbers. And again, can you, can you tell us all? Because oh, we're just, Jody's just looking it up now. So, yeah. And well, Brent, Brent, who's Brent Smith, who's with the Department of Environment and Science and Innovation up the back, has. Our concern is, is that it's not showing real loss, and without us knowing what real loss is, then it's, it's meaningless. Like it hasn't been spoken about today as to why the koalas aren't allowed back. Yeah. But can I can I answer that part? Yeah. Like, you know, with, with the with the hysteria that we see around, oh, the koalas are going, even our elders are. Uh, you know, get get a bit annoyed about it, but this is the world we live in. We, we, you know, as traditional owners, we didn't bring these effects to these koalas, but if as traditional owners, if we say, nah, go and run the gauntlet, because we've had lots of people tap us on the shoulder, oh, let them come back, let them come back. Now, if there's hysteria on social media in that now, imagine the hysteria if we start letting the koalas come back and then we get some mad disease run rampage through a lot of them. Okay, can I just, can I, excuse me, can I, yep, can I just move on because we do need to talk about other things as well. But I just wanted to talk about that Redland City Council issue though because like Jeff said, there's lots, you know, these issues are, are not just, they seem like one but they're not the whole lot. But the fact that there's so many of these koalas getting attacked by dogs, so the council once embarked upon making some of us national park rangers and community rangers as authorised officers, we could not get the cooperation from the Redland City Council to support us in our compliance actions. We would give them names, dates, photos, and I've seen that many dead koalas, it's not funny, from dog attacks. The council would not do anything. Now we've got Desi, and I was remiss earlier of uh, uh, mentioning Desi as our number one partner um, that funds the majority of the work we do um, and where we've got Desi compliance officers having to step in and do compliance action outside of parks on council land where dogs are killing koalas. So that's, you know, if you want to say anything, get onto the council. 
Yeah, and I think this goes back to Jody's point. This is all a shared responsibility and how can we now have the proactive conversations needed to bring about the change? And so one way is not just advocacy, but getting very clear and getting into the planning processes. Because when Jeff pointed out just what it takes, there is a very clear process. And I have come to learn if we're not in that process, it doesn't matter. We can talk as much as we like and as loud as we like, but the reality is these processes are how we can actually really pro proactively advocate. So if I may, I would love to turn uh, the phone across, uh, sorry, the microphone across to Megan. And and there's a bit of interest in the story of Winnie, like the follow-up, what happened, um, what can you share, what do we actually know about where Winnie got released and or life after care? Um, so, um, so she was released. Um, she was from a while ago, so it was 2018. So um, all I know is she was released. I think back then we were still releasing koalas um, on the island potentially, um, but I actually don't know 100% sure where she was released. Um, I would have to try and follow that one up. Thank you. And I'll keep the microphone with you if I may. What percentage of the koala hospitalizations that you get at the RSPCA come from Mindyuraba? Um So I think from the statistics I drew up from our um, files, we've had about 62 animals um, come across from Minjeriba, um, which I think over over the years we see about 500 koalas every year from all over southeast Queensland. Um, so it's not a huge percentage, um, but it is, I guess, in terms of the number of koalas here, probably a reasonable number. Um, we obviously only see the ones that do make it across to us, so we don't see anything that doesn't make it. Um, and some of them might go to other facilities potentially as well. Um, I have a question again, and I'm not sure if you can answer this one, but I'll, I'll, give, I'll ask it. Was it significant that Winnie received early stabilisation from a vet on North Stradbroke before being sent to the hospital? Yeah, I think it was. Um, I think the sooner that we can stabilise koalas that are injured for any reason, um, the sooner they can get veterinary care, pain relief, and especially those antibiotics in the case of a dog attack injury, um, the better chance of survival that they have. Um, obviously, it's really tricky to have a vet on the island, um, there needs to be support and funding to um, be able to have that kind of facility here, I think. Yeah. All right, my next question is for you, Paulie. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice one. Why, you might not even know, but why do you think the breeding season started early this year? Um, I don't really know. I'm not a scientist. I'm just a dickhead that runs around jumping on wildlife, basically. <laughs> um, sorry about the swearing. I don't know. Is it climate change? Is it who knows? I, I can't answer it. Yeah. But I know what's happening. So, yeah, we're two months early than what we normally are this year. So, yep. Um, one thing I've heard is that we've got trees that have flowered and fruited four times this year. Um, you know, the carbon load in the atmosphere and things all around the place. But, um, and that was all Uncle Greg Lutherland told me that too, so it's just got to be true. Three to four times compared to how many usually? Mm. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, but animals work off the environment too, not out in the normal calendar you think is the yeah, Paulie, how many um, koalas have been returned to the island when they've been sent off for treatment to come back? We don't get them back. Okay. Well, did, did we not just have that yeah. conversation? Can we I? Just, we just had the conversation that if we bring them back, there's the biohazard. And I think the other thing we have said is that this there was a moratorium put in place in response to a concern about the potential to introduce novel diseases onto the island to a population that has low levels of disease. And we are working through a process to allow the animals to be returned. But as I said, the number of animals that are taken and don't return is a very small number compared with the number of animals that actually die and are impacted on the island itself. So the significant focus needs to be on recovering and protecting the animals on the island. And you've got to remember when we send animals over, first and foremost, it needs help. If we don't send it over, that the odds are it's going to die. And we totally get 
what everyone asks, but as rescuers, we're concerned about the animal. First if it foremost, needs help, yeah. it needs help. We're not going to stand there and, oh, my God, if we send it over, it's not coming back. That's not our job. Our job is they can't talk. So yeah. we we send it because we've assessed and it needs help. So related to That's that, there's, there's quite a few questions in the chat. Would a local facility and more local on-island support work and would it be, I guess, viable? Because this is a not just a, it is a whole of South East Queensland issue. So if I could pose that to the panel. So obviously I mentioned earlier, Jade's developing up her, her veterinary <laughs> clinic. We've had the conversation what, what Jade needs to bring that up to the level of care that wouldn't negate the animal having to go over there, comes back to dollars, you know. So Kayak obviously will be contributing whatever we can to assist with that. But, um, you know, the point is don't we, we can't let hysteria start to, to dial this conversation. There has to be that line. We, we can't open that door. I th think again from the Queensland government's perspective, we have met we met with Jade a number of times to talk through, I guess, the types of facilities that would assist in being able to both provide that triage, immediate triage support with the right facilities to do some of the assessments that are done at the wildlife hospitals, but also to be able to provide that pain relief, but also importantly to potentially be able to euthanise animals so that animals aren't actually transported off the island and then euthanised. 24 hours later after that fact. So there's, we've certainly had discussions with that, with there's certainly no closed door on the idea, but we'll acknowledge that the establishment of and the operation of a wildlife hospital is a very expensive endeavour. And um, the, the money that we invest in the SEQ wildlife hospital networks is significant. And we have part of the conversations we've had is about the idea that those other facilities would be prepared to partner with or provide support to um, some type of facility or the wildlife care group over here to, to better position them to be able to provide that initial triage support, the pain relief and the, the ability to euthanise animals at an early stage to avoid them being transported. So. I was just going to add, um, to back up what Jeff was just saying, um, Koala, veterinary care is quite specialised and so it's not just that initial triage or that initial surgery that we do, it's the ongoing care. It's having nurses there at night time to check the koalas, um, you know, 24-7 we have specialised cutters to go out and get leaf for them. So it's quite involved to be able to have a wildlife hospital um, and so it's, it's not a simple process, unfortunately. Yeah, and with that obviously comes a huge dollar cost. Now I'm just going to turn our questions, if I may. Um, I don't have a space in the vet clinic dedicated to wildlife. I tried to secure funding that for, for that before the bill, but I was unsuccessful despite my best efforts. However, I have designed that vet clinic to be quite flexible and adaptable and definitely with wildlife in mind. Uh -huh. I have hired all my staff with experience, skills, passion necessary to treat small animals and wildlife, and we are in a prime position to help this whole story. And I've been talking to Desi and Kayak for years, so watch this space. Do yeah, that's and absolutely fabulous. Keep up the amazing work. And it's just on the top really of that, like Stratty, you know, it's all, everyone loves Stratty. It's hip, you know, they're filming movies over here. I think we've got something like 10 pubs, um, 10 alcohol outlets. Um, so we, you think we could at least have a koala hospital here? Look, if so. I was running it, I would be taxing every visitor onto the island, but that's just my two cents for business, how to run it and how to actually get the funding that you all actually need. So can you lobby to uh, hit it from that angle? Because I'm sure tourists would pay. So let's, let's, get, it, let's get it moving. Um, if I could just turn to the fire, bushfire management, and there's a, a beautiful question in here that I would really like to just pose to the, the kayak team. Kayak work is leading the way in how to get fire back on country. How can this knowledge be shared to mainland communities to help scale up this important work? Well, I, you know, I don't know that it can, but, you know, we see some of the conversation. Um, you know, there was a big move after some of the big bushfires to get Aboriginal involvement, 
um, in fires and we even had people suggest to us that we needed some of these Aboriginal fire practitioners to come to Stratty to tell us how to do fire and we said, why, why would we want that? Like, you know, we, it would be like us running the flag up saying, well, we don't know. We need someone else to come and tell us. So, like from an island perspective, we can't talk outside of Stratty. You know, like, but I think the conversation in principle, though, needs to be along, well, it's not this way or that way. It's it's the multiple ways to look at it, you know. Um, the conversation, you know, it's just just around practicalities and, and being honest. Um, I think there's – it's not a shift in the Indigenous community. It's actually a shift in um, the organisations and the land managers to embrace what is cultural burning, but also – for governments to understand that the cost and the money they spend in doing wildfire mitigation when it burns is the investment you need to put into the bushfire in proposed in plan burning. <clears throat> We're taking a lot of time out where you miss opportunities in the weather to be able to get good burns on country because of just the bureaucracy of the processes, the money and the finances. Whereas if you've actually fund that up front, you shift the focus to be, you know, better down the track of reducing the cost in wildfires. So we did that with Flinders where we really shifted the focus back to put the money into plan burning, invest properly and use that wisely to actually deliver a better outcome. Yeah, I just want to add a, a bit to what Dan and Darren have said is that I think absolutely acknowledge that um, Kayak have led the way in particularly in relation to this application of fire to preserve koala habitat um, in southeast Queensland and absolutely reinforce Dan's point that we tend to, uh, after we've had large scale wildfires, we tend to then have the government investing a lot of money in repair and restoration work following fire, not necessarily in that uh, avoidance of fire space. And I think the, the wildfire has demonstrated, the wildfire season in 2019, 2020 demonstrated to us that yes, fire can have a catastrophic impact on populations where that wildfire goes through and destroys habitat, but the post-fire recovery has also demonstrated to us that the introduction of fire into those landscapes allows us to better manage that habitat in a way that that habitat can better support the populations of koalas and other species that use it. So. The judicious application of plan burn, particularly cool plan burns in that thick um, bush, is a really important sort of fire management tool to both prepare and improve the habitat, but also reduce the risk of wildfire in the future. And it's um, something we're seeking to invest in in some of the re habitat restoration projects is not simply planting tr new trees, but actually managing existing habitat through both weed control, but also the application of fire. Jeff, while you've still got the phone, there was a question in the chat. Um, do we know with your goal to restore 10,000 hectares of koala habitat, how many hectare, hectares have been achieved so far? That's a really good question. It's a question I wish I could give you the answer to exactly today. Um, part of the project that we're running with Healthy Land and Water to look at habitat restoration and a more strategic approach to it is to engage with all the other entities that are currently involved in koala habitat restoration. So. Um, it isn't simply a Queensland government project. Um, there's um, others that are doing it on our behalf. There's others that are doing it under the auspice of the Commonwealth government. And there are others that are doing it under the auspice of other non-government organisations. So it, in order to answer that question, we need to collate that information. And also that will set us up to identify where we can best invest to complement the activities that others are already doing. So it's that whole let's work out what everybody else is doing and rather than reinventing things or investing in our own activities, let's complement and support the groups that are already active in that space. So uh, hopefully within 12 months I'll be able to give you the exact answer but not today. So the answer is coming is the short answer. <laughs> um, folks, I'm going to draw um, the question and answer session to a close and I just apologise profusely if I've now missed a few. I've tried to collapse and address as much as we possibly can. The speakers aren't running away, so please take time now to come and talk to any and all of us. Um, if I could just ask my team, Louisa, Tori and also Kim, Megan, I've already singled out. You're welcome to stand up again. If you could all stand up, please. I just want to point to these people and just 
This is my moment to talk about the amazing work that this team does. We are project funded, so that means we only get funded if we get the work. And what this team has achieved in the last year alone is that they have effectively engaged one million people. That is not just here in Australia. We now have people who watch us from overseas, and that's important with our Olympics actually coming up. So this might be people who've been involved in one of our training sessions. They've downloaded the dog training app here at the forums like you are today. Um, our team work incredibly hard. So I just wanted to thank them um, and get you to thank them as well for all the work that they do. And I'm just going to reiterate the words that Jody actually spoke. Like there has been reference to some organisations and the community groups, and I know there are yet other groups here who work tirelessly, from planting trees to doing the community monitoring to working hard to make the best, you know, their premises the best they can be, whether they've got funding or not. And we're no different as a, a team. You've been, you've heard today just from Rihanna just how hard it is in our space to get funded to do the work that we really no needs to be done and it feels like there's never enough. I often say I feel like a homeless person sitting there with my cap because the reality is to do this work, that's what we're doing. We're out there begging constantly and wondering why it still today seems to be so hard. So for all of you that have come together to give up your time this morning, thank you because I know each and every one of you cares and is trying to actually make a difference. And teams like ours are out there trying to get even more other people to care. So the idea is in the chat, like, yes, we need to be working with the tourists, we do. We really should have really great entertaining stuff on those barges as people come in and out to teach them that wildlife is wild and that we don't want to actually be there. So we understand there is so much more work that needs to be done and keep talking to us and putting it there. And if we can teach everyone how to advocate positively and really get this, that actually supports teams like Jeff's who care and are actually trying to get more funding to do the work that they do. So again, on behalf of us, a big thank you to Desi for funding today and bringing the conversation onto Kwandamuka country. I think it's been a really excellent event. So thank you all.